I had a friend who trained as a lawyer, then became disenchanted and never practiced. He told me that the one benefit of those wasted years was that he no longer feared either the law or lawyers. And something like that happens more generally, doesn't it? The more you learn, the less you fear. Learn not in the sense of academic study, but in the practical understanding of life. Perhaps all I'm really saying is that, having gone out with Veronica all those years ago, I wasn't afraid of her now. And so I began my email campaign. I was determined to be polite, unoffendable, persistent, boring, friendly. In other words, to lie. Of course, it takes only a microsecond to delete an email, but then it doesn't take much longer to replace the one deleted. I would wear her down with niceness, and I would get Adrian's diary. There was no undoused fire in my breast, I had assured Margaret of this, and... As for her more general advice, let's say that one advantage of being an ex-husband is that you no longer need to justify your behaviour or follow suggestions. I could tell Veronica was perplexed by my approach. Sometimes she answered briefly and crossly, often not at all. Nor would she have been flattered to know the precedent for my plan. Towards the end of my marriage, the solid suburban villa Margaret and I lived in suffered a little subsidence. Cracks appeared here and there, bits of the porch and front wall began to crumble, and no, I don't think of it as symbolic. The insurance company ignored the fact that it had been a famously dry summer, and decided to blame the lime tree in our front garden. It wasn't an especially beautiful tree, nor was I fond of it, for various reasons. It screened out light from the front room, dropped sticky stuff on the pavement, and overhung the street in a way that encouraged pigeons to perch there and crap on the cars parked beneath. Our car, especially. My objection to cutting it down was based on principle, not the principle of maintaining the country's stock of trees, but the principle of not kowtowing to unseen bureaucrats, baby-faced arborists, and current faddy theories of blame adduced by insurance companies. Also, Margaret quite liked the tree. So I prepared a long defensive campaign. I queried the arborist's conclusions and requested the digging of extra inspection pits to confirm or disprove the presence of rootlets close to the house's foundations. I argued over weather patterns, the great London clay belt, the imposition of a region-wide hosepipe ban and so on. I was rigidly polite. I aped my opponent's bureaucratic language I annoyingly attached copies of previous correspondence to each new letter. I invited further site inspections and suggested extra use for their manpower. With each letter, I managed to come up with another query they would have to spend their time considering. If they failed to answer it, my next letter, instead of repeating the query, would refer them to the third or fourth paragraph of my communication of the 17th inst, so that they would have to look up their ever-fattening file. I was careful not to come across as a loony, but rather as a pedantic, unignorable bore. I liked to imagine the moaning and groaning as yet another of my letters arrived, and I knew that at a certain point it would make bean-counting sense for them just to close the case. Eventually, exasperatedly, they proposed a 30% reduction in the lime tree's canopy, a solution I accepted with deep expressions of regret and much inner exhilaration. Veronica, as I'd anticipated, didn't enjoy being treated like an insurance company. I'll spare you the tedium of our exchanges and cut to its first practical consequence. I received a letter from Mrs. Marriott enclosing what she described as a fragment of the disputed document. She expressed the hope that the next months might bring a full restitution of my legacy. I thought this showed a lot of optimism. The fragment turned out to be a photocopy of a fragment. But, even after forty years, I knew it was authentic. Adrian wrote in a distinctive italic hand with an eccentric G. Needless to say, Veronica hadn't sent me the first page or the last, or indicated where this one came in the diary. If diary was still the right word, for a text set out in numbered paragraphs. This is what I read. 5.4. The question of accumulation. 
If life is a wager, what form does the bet take? At the racetrack, an accumulator is a bet which rolls on profits from the success of one horse to engross the stake on the next one. 5.5. So, A. To what extent might human relationships be expressed in a mathematical or logical formula? And, B. If so, what signs might be placed between the integers? Plus and minus, self-evidently, sometimes multiplication, and yes, division. But these signs are limited. Thus an entirely failed relationship might be expressed in terms of both loss stroke minus and division stroke reduction, showing a total of zero, whereas an entirely successful one can be represented by both addition and multiplication. But what of most relationships? Do they not require to be expressed in notations which are logically improbable and mathematically insoluble? 5.6 Thus, how might you express an accumulation containing the integers b, a to the power of 1, a squared, s, v? b equals s minus v times or plus a to the power of 1, or a squared plus v plus a to the power of 1 times s, equals b. 5.7 Or is that the wrong way to put the question and express the accumulation? Is the application of logic to the human condition in and of itself self-defeating? What becomes of a chain of argument when the links are made of different metals, each with a separate frangibility? 5.8 Or is link a false metaphor? 5.9. But allowing that it is not, if a link breaks wherein lies the responsibility for such breaking, on the links immediately on either side, or on the whole chain? But what do we mean by the whole chain? How far do the limits of responsibility extend? 6. Or we might try to draw the responsibility more narrowly and apportion it more exactly and not use equations and integers, but instead express matters in traditional narrative terminology. So, for instance, if to 